Hello, everybody. My name is Sammy. I'm the CEO of Certicraft. Uh, we are on a mission to help craft cannabis producers transition into and thrive within the regulated market here in Canada. Uh, and we do that primarily through our flagship product, Certicraft, which is a compliance platform that makes those ridiculously tedious uh, reporting and re record keeping requirements uh, super is simple. Is it TNT I should be on? Hey, Marcus, can you mute uh, yourself so for a moment? Sorry. No worries. Um, I'll introduce our lovely guests here in a moment. Uh, first, just wanted to share a few housekeeping items. Um, we have a chat. Um, I see the interface is not as obvious as it has been in the past. In the bottom right corner, there's like a little button there that says chat. Uh, if you click on that, you can uh, um, share your thoughts, introduce yourself. We, we love sessions where people are engaging. It becomes a lot more fun when uh, there's kind of that back and forth between the audience and uh, our guests here. Um, uh, next to the chat button, there's a questions button. If you have any questions for our uh, guests here today, please ask them there. Uh, at the end of the discussion, we'll go through the questions um, and uh, you can upvote questions that you like and we'll answer the questions in order of what's received the most upvotes. Um, and uh, yeah, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce to you our lovely guests here today. Uh, we have uh, Hartley from Lady Jane Cannabis out in New Brunswick. I believe it's New Brunswick, right, Hartley? You got it. Yeah. Right. And, and then we have uh, uh, Mike and Marcus. Uh, Marcus is perhaps better known as Bubble Man uh, from Embark Health. And you guys are based out of BC, if I'm remembering correctly. Is, is, that, is that correct? Yep. Awesome. Still to be yes. seen. Um, so yeah, before we get into the discussion, I'd love to just kind of go um in a circle here and just have each of you maybe say 30 to 60 seconds uh something about yourself um, um just give people a background on who you are and uh why they should uh listen to you and your perspective today why why, why they should give you the time of day <laughs> hartley you want to go first you're you're in my top left corner there so sure thank you so my name is hartley prosser and i'm the chief compliance officer at lady jane labs and I'm uh, one of the co-founders, uh, one of five, and we've been licensed for about a year now. Uh, we're a microprocessor and a micro cultivator, and we focus specifically in producing solventless extracts uh, and as well as solventless genetics. And everything we do is for the love of the plant, the love of the hash, love of the medicine. And uh, my background is, is science. Um, I've got a degree in agricultural science. Uh, experience in quality assurance, food production, uh, manufacturing. So that's what I'm bringing to the table. And and through the last, you know, three or four years in this industry, I've learned a lot about the challenges, the 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 bonuses, the advantages, and and uh, definitely looking forward to discussing with with these folks here today who have such an awesome background as well. Awesome, thanks, Hartley. We've lost Marcus briefly here. Mike, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Mike West, also known as MC West on all the socials. I am a cannabis refugee, medical patient. I actually moved to Canada from the States, became a medical patient in the early 2000s. Uh, ended up moving to Colorado to become a medical patient because the laws in Texas, I didn't want to go to jail. Um, ended up becoming one of the very early uh, medical patients in Colorado, helped get Colorado's medical dispensaries licensed in 2008 through 2010, as well as a couple of rec licenses. And then since then, I've been building medical companies and recreational companies across most of the US um, through the early 20 teens. And then with Canada's passage of recreational cannabis over the last couple of years, um, I've moved up here to Vancouver because my wife's Canadian and I don't want to go to jail for being considered a kingpin according to U.S. federal law. So I'm a medical patient first and foremost. I enjoy, you know, pheno hunting, breeding cannabis at my home, and then building cannabis processing facilities for regulated produce, regulated licensed producers. Um, currently advising a couple companies here in Canada, down in the States. Uh, my primary day job is as head of security at Embark Health. We're a licensed uh, cannabis processor, R&D lab, and edible manufacturer here in Vancouver, uh, specifically Delta, BC. We've got a 40,000 square foot facility that we've been working on building 
since 2018. Um, we actually got the license issued in April of 2020. So we've been licensed since 420 um, and primarily focused on for the first round focused on solventless extraction. So obviously we got Bubble Man joining, he'll talk about it, but we're solventless, primarily solventless producer at this point. We're gonna be adding solvent extracts as well as a multiplicity of different uh, extraction methods and uh, manufacturing. So currently producing Hank bubble hash, the hazel hash stick, which is a hash joint, distilled and infused, which is a nano infused beverage mix, as well as doing a bunch of white label manufacturing for other edible companies, beverage companies, and growers that want to sell hash. Um, awesome. I'll, I'll let Mark talk about the solve in this program here. Thanks, Mike. And you made it back just in the nick of time there, Marcus. Thank you for making it. <laughs> well, we'll see. I went to Chrome. It's uh, it's not any better. I can't okay. see any of your cameras, but I'll do my best. I'll do my best. How's, uh, were we doing introductions? Is that what was happening? Yep. And Mike just finished introducing both Embark and himself. And uh, you're the last one up. If you can say um, a few things about yourself and uh, your history in this world of craft cannabis, um, that will be much appreciated. Well, I don't distinguish the difference between cannabises. I'm just involved in cannabis and all the little subcategories people want to put into it. I just, I love cannabis. We love to divide in the world as human beings. So we love to create, you know, oh, let's call this craft and oh, this is the big, big LP. I just love cannabis and I've been involved in it for 30 plus years. Um, started, uh, I'm freezing up. I can't, I kind of can't tell. We can mostly hear you. There's like, there's little, oh, no, and you're gone. Okay, well, let's just uh, kick off the discussion without Marcus. Um, for those of you in the audience, uh, he is more commonly known as Bubble Man in the world of uh, extraction. Do Hartley or, or Mike, do either of you guys want to say maybe a sentence or two about, uh, about his history? So Bubble Man's been in the industry for about, 30 years. Um, everybody knows him as Bubble Band because he's one of the primary equipment manufacturers of bubble bags. So if you guys ever have made bubble hash, um, there's very few equipment manufacturers that actually make those bags. And I believe Marcus has been distributing bubble bags since 95 or 98. Wow. Um, also been involved in the hemp industry here in Canada. And uh, medical patient. I'll let him talk about the transition into medical because he worked with some of the earliest medical dispensaries here in Canada. Um, yeah, we've got Bubble Man brand in the uh, chat. So if you guys ever need bubble hash produ production processing equipment, that's a great link. Uh, honestly, I've been I've known Bubble Man for about a decade, about 10, 11 years ago, he started a YouTube channel and started hosting weekly chats called Hash Church. And then Hash Church is basically Bubble Man's way of networking all of the hash and cannabis extraction professionals within the industry to a nice, wonderful four hour session every Sunday or most Sundays when the snowboarding ain't good. And <laughs> this guy, <laughs> and it's a great way, you know, Hash Church is one of several platforms that, uh, that allows, you know, cannabis production and processors to be able to open source their technology. So, you know, discussion of different trends in techno technology, figuring out what ways we can extract efficiently and sustainably, as well as discuss, you know, trending science topics. So, you know, we've, if anybody has smoked rosin, I believe that was developed by a gentleman by the name of Sal, but it became super popular after I want to say it was 2014, 2015, one of the hash churches that we actually had him come on, discuss it and show it while they were at, out at Spanibus. So there's been a multiplicity of information that's been distributed through hash church. If anyone's looking for a multiple year college level course uh, video list, go to Bubble Man's YouTube page, check out the hash church. There's probably 250, 300 churches on there. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to, while I was working down in the States, join Hash Church to discuss what was going on in my, my respective licensees down in the States. 
But as the cannabis industry has gone recreational up here, we've we've been working together, help helping build this solventless processing capacity facility. So it took us about three years to get licensed, about a year and a half to get the building rezoned, and then uh, about three, four months to get it licensed after we got it zoned. Cool. Well, I see Marcus is in the, uh, in the he's, he's connected, but having trouble getting online right now. I feel like an idiot because I suggested trying a different solution a few minutes ago, and that was uh, probably the wrong decision uh, of, a, of a session to go in. But uh, this is this is where we are right now. So I apologize, Marcus, if you can hear us for making that suggestion. <laughs> Should have just stuck with what was not working that well, but at least working. Um, uh, all right. So while while Bubble Man's trying to get in here, let's just get started with this discussion. So. For those of you who are new here in our audience, uh, with State of Craft, always, we, we always follow kind of three general um, big, uh, qu vague, open-ended questions, which is what's going well in the world of legal craft cannabis, what's not going so well, and what needs to change in order to make things uh, better and make it possible for people to legitimately thrive in this industry. Um, and so we'll kick it off with exactly that. Uh, Hartley and Mike, I'm curious. Uh, what do you guys think is going legitimately well in this world of uh, cannabis that we are all part of here today? Yeah, I'd say um, I'll, uh, I'll take go first there. Um, basically, for us, off the top of my head, I could say amongst craft producers, one of the things that I really noticed that is uh, awesome and very heartwarming is the, is the sense of collaboration. So a lot of the craft producers we reach, reach out to and want to work with um, or who reach out to us, it's, it's all about collaboration. Let's, let's find a way to work together. Let's find a way to, you know, make a product together or, you know, help each other out in, in some capacity. Um, and, and I just don't see that as much with, with the larger scale um, producers. I, I see it more from the smaller batch uh, producers, you know, you craft producers. So I'd say uh, for me, that, that gives us a, a real strong sense of a push forward that there's, there's people out there that are, are real They're you know, they're, it's face to face and no hidden agendas and, and they just want to work together. And that's, you know, overall, that's, that's a sense that I've been getting over the last year or two being licensed. Um, so yeah, I don't know if, um, if there's anything else, if, if Mike, you feel the same way with the craft, but uh, for us, the collaboration has been awesome. So we, we've been developing uh, one specific brand called sauce, sauce rosin labs. And it's all about those collaborative, uh, collaborative ventures, right? So we're developing um, specific solventless products that are made with other cultivators, genetics, other cultivators, material, um, and, and it's been awesome. It's been really great to, to, you know, sift through the different inventories, the different craft products available in the market in terms of flour, um, and be able to, 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 to wash it and press it and, and turn it into all the different artisanal, you know, solventless products. Uh, and what comes out the other side is, is always beautiful, beautiful fire. So I really, uh, really excited to, to bring some of these products to market. You know, shine light on on the producers, shine light on on the cultivators, um, who who put in that hard work, put in that love for the plant, uh, and then and then we took it and put in our love for the hash, uh, and and together, you know, making products for for that brand. So that's that's definitely been a really great thing in in, in a really sort of stiff industry with a lot of stiff regulations, to be working with other humans who are you know flexible and willing to sort of compromise and 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 sort of meet in the middle at some times it's it's really nice marcus welcome back just to bring you up to speed we're just talking about uh what we think is going really well in the world of uh legal cannabis here um so hartley's, awesome. hartley's i'm listening is... i'm doing the best i can i can't I, i've managed to somehow get in now my airpods aren't working so i'll just have to listen to the audio on my <laughs> one of those I days eh? this morning as i drove up to whistler I'm currently not snowboarding on powder because I'm doing this. So this is like kind of one of those days where I'm just like biting my tongue. But at the same time, we're going to get through this. My buddy just brought me some dabs. So I'm all good. Awesome. Well, well while, we, while we've got you here on the line, do you want to tell us what you think is going pretty well in this world of legal cannabis? 
Well, I think it's cool that um, people aren't having their children taken away and having guns put in their faces and being arrested and giving PTSD from, from the experiences they're having from the jails and the, and the police. Uh, I think that's amazing. I think a lot of people in the industry who did not come from legacy, uh, they've never had a gun pointed in their face and they've never had uh, you know their kids put in the back of a police car and they've never had these things happen over being a habitual florist. So I think right off the bat, we should all kind of give props for that. Of course, there's a lot of work left. There's a lot of people in, in jail, uh, especially in America. So by all means, the work is not done. But I focus on that before I focus on the business aspect. Oh, I had to pay this and I had to pay that. And they're doing this to me there and, do, and they're doing that to me. And I'm, you know what, no matter how much whining I hear in this industry, it just doesn't quite sound the same as they shot my dog and took my kids and gave me five years. It just doesn't sound the same. So that's that's kind of my mentality. I, I think we're lucky and blessed, and the fact that uh, we've got legal cannabis is a, is a pretty big deal. Uh, could I complain? Of course, of course, we could all complain about overregulation and taxes and all of these different things. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is somehow our country decided to allow this to happen on a federal level, and overall, I'm just really appreciative. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a sobering perspective when you when you think of yeah, people aren't being threatened with violence. They're not being thrown in jail. They're not having their families completely disrupted, and and that uh, that stress that comes with knowing that that could ever happen, that could always potentially happen to you. I mean, I guess in some ways that still exists to some degree for people who feel like they can't make the transition yet due to all of the burdens of regulations and the financial uh, factors. Like, not not everybody feels comfortable like navigating the world of bureaucracy that uh, is required well, to navigate right now. You know now. what? Not everyone felt comfortable putting their life at risk and going to prison. And so it was even, trust me, more people yeah. feel comfortable now than did before. And so there's always going to be people who feel, well, they're trying to keep me out. It's like, it would be like us talking about, say, um, you know, building uh, giant buildings in Vancouver. Have they been keeping all of us out of that? Or is that just something that's really beyond our reach for whatever reasons, for the choices that we've made? You know, you yeah. can't just say I've smoked cannabis and now I'm entitled to be involved in an industry of cannabis because I've smoked cannabis. That's just not how the world works. You know, if you want to be involved, you got to figure it out and you got to find your way. And, and what I'll say about, you know, craft cannabis, LP cannabis, all size cannabis is that right now, you have to find the pockets of profitability. They're small little pockets that you have to go because the pool got drained by these, you know, these mining companies and these stock market plays. They came in, they, you know, they got us to fill up the pool with more money than we even realized was in our community. And then they took the majority of it on stock plays. And so they've gone now, they're all sitting on their yachts enjoying their $50 million uh, payouts that they got. And the rest of us are sitting here like, wow, okay, so now the real work begins. Now we have to really, really make sure that, you know, that economic viability exists in that pocket that you're looking for. And, and lucky enough, uh, you know, Mike and I at Embark, we've managed to find a few of those pockets. Is it going to be like, oh, we're going to do pre-roll joints. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we're gonna no, it's not like that. It's like, okay, we figured out our hazel hash joint. It's novel. It's unique. It comes from legacy. We give props. We partnered up to, with the legacy people. We've created that pathway, and now people are very receptive, and they're buying a lot of these pure hash joints. And we have zero competition across the board, and we have a decent you know, economic viability within that little pocket. Now, in the meantime, trying to do Bubble Man brand and doing – high-end live rosins and high-end bubble hashes, there's almost no economic viability in that right now because of the maturity of where we're at in the industry. Will we get there? Of course. If you want to see where you're going to get, just go look at California. You know, they've been at it the longest. They're the center of the cannabis universe and everyone eventually ends up where Cali is. They just do it about five to 10 day, uh, <laughs> years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would second the, uh, the challenge of of the, the premium tier rosins, premium tier ice water hash. That is so, you know, it's, it's abundant in the, in the traditional market and in the U S market, but here in the legal market in Canada, it's, is very hard to get any economic viability to get any of that uh, <laughs> on the shelf and, and flowing, but slowly, slowly, like Marcus said, it's, it's coming.
and we're uh, we're happy to be part of that. Yeah, and that, yeah. that has all to do with the regulations. You know, we're regulated so so heavily. When I first made Bubble with Mike, and we wrapped, we put the Tropicana cookies in there. We were hand spinning it. I didn't really realize at the end, I was like, okay, we got eight different grades of bubble from that one batch. And then, you know, the QA was like, well, do you want to keep them all separate? I'm like, well, of course there's, I didn't separate them just to mix them. And he's like, okay, well, we'll have to do a COA for each one. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, we'll have to do a COA for each one. I'm like, well, can't we just take like a little bit of each one and put them all together? He's like, no, we have to do a $1,200 COA for each bag. So now I've got $10,000 worth of COAs because I want to separate my microns. So that right there has just deciphered that unless you create that pocket where, okay, what if we make bubble and we get the 90 and the 73, those are the only two that are going to be really the highest quality. Now we have to make sure that the 190, the 160, the 120, and the 45 and the 25, which will be 75% of the bubble that got made, has to have a place for that to go as well. Right now in this industry, when people call me and say, we're looking for bubble, we need 10 kilos. Uh, we're like, well, how much, or, you know, what, what kind of price are you looking at? And they're hey, like, well, hey, you know. We hey, go Marcus, ahead. I just want to, I just want to stop you for a moment there. Can, for, can you take a moment to just describe to our audience, for those who don't know how bubble hash is created, can you just walk us sure. through like in a very short synopsis, what bubble hash is, how it's made and those numbers that you're throwing out those micron ranges, what that really means. Cause I think we might have some people here who don't know that. So basically we're using water and ice to freeze the wax membrane of the trichome gland head. And then it becomes brittle and in the mixing with the ice and the water, the glands break off and due to their density, they sink in the water. They're still affected by gravity. Everything else floats. So you get this amazing transfer chamber of all plant matter floating up top and little trichome heads sinking to the bottom, falling through different micron diameter screens, depending on the diameter of the glandular trichome head, it will land in accordance to the screen that it fits on. I use eight screens with my bag, starting at 220, going down to 190, going down to 160, 120, 90, 73, 45, and finally the 25 micron bag. We get a range of hashes that show up in each of those things. Now, if I took all of those hashes and I put them together, I guess you could call it a full spectrum hash now, unless you know, there are three types of trichomes and generally for dry sifting and water extraction, i.e. mechanical screen separation, you want the two, which is the capitate stock and the capitate sessile. Those are, have the long stalks and the heads have small necks and they break off really easy. The third type, however, is called bulbous and it sits almost right on the leaf. It's actually on a single stipe cell, but you can't see with the naked eye and it doesn't break off very easily. So often when you hear oil guys say, oh, I got a 22% yield, but the bubble guys like, that's so weird. I only got 12% yield. How did you get that much, almost 50% more while well, you look under the microscope and you quickly see, oh, he's running a cultivar, cultivar that is high in bulbous trichomes. I've noticed. CBD cultivars tend to be high in bulbous, you know, novel cannabinoids. When you're growing THCA, you get that capitate stock and capitate sessile. When you start cutting down early or you're looking for novel cannabinoids, you can find them in the bulbous heads and they do not extract very well with mechanical screens. So there are certain cultivars that make sense more so to do in butane or uh, iso or uh, sorry, um, ethanol or CO2 versus you know the mechanical screen separation so one of the things about building the quiver at embark was so that we could run all of this material through a multitude of extraction processes and find where that resin belongs to be extracted in the first place so you know that's why we do all the that's why i'd love to be able to separate out the glands and really get that quality up to the highest level but with $10,000 in COAs and a very, very small margin to begin with, I mean, I, I sell it for, you know, $15 a gram to OCS and it's, it's going in at like 35 plus before CRA. Like it's hard to get this stuff down and it's very, it's, it's expensive to make. It's not cheap. Like we're not going out and buying 10 cents a gram, you know, which is also, I'd love to say that the beginning of extraction craft or otherwise in, in Canada was very much like what's in the vault that you can't sell. What's the worst stuff we have. Let's send that over to the extractors. They need to learn that we want their best stuff. Take your worst stuff and roll it into your pre-roll joints for all I care, but give us your great stuff because we want to extract from the best, not the worst. And right now, 
there's still a lot of that going on in Canada. People are, well, I got this trim. It's two years old. It's 10 cents a gram. It's like, are you interested in that? No, not at all. Like, in <laughs> fact, that is the thing that my nightmares are made of. That's where, you know, Here's turning the crystal it. Yeah, exactly. manufacturers. It's, 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 no, yeah. it's no different than food. Like, you're, you're, when you're cooking food, if you use shitty ingredients, you're going to end up with shitty food. If you yeah. use good True ingredients, story. that's that's the foundation of good food. You just start with good ingredients. Exactly. Music, and the food same thing play, with music, good samples it, or whatever. It, it, the food one plays even more accurately to cannabis because it also, food that is grown organically in living soils with mycorrhizal fungi living on the roots and biodynamic procedures going on in the farms, this tends to get a plant to express itself in a way that is more in tune with, say, an Olympic athlete training for the Olympics versus salt grown nutrients sometimes you know you'll see that you'll see the expressions and they're just they're just not what they should be you, you know maybe an exceptional grower will get it up to a point where you're like wow you did that with salts that's absolutely i've seen amazing product grown with salt nutrients but i can't compare the two food or cannabis resin organic and and living soil is always better it just produces terpenes and aromatic compounds that are that don't seem to exist when when it's grown with salts and that's of course just my opinion i've got, yeah. I've got one last question for you marcus before we like resume the discussion related to like the, just the the mechanics of uh, extraction do, do do terpenes and flavonoids do they also show up in the trichomes or is the trichomes limited to cannabinoids or i guess to anybody here you're all experts on this there's a whole variety of aromatic compounds that are present. Now, this conversation is very new. Um, I've been talking a lot with Nick Ziegler, who used to work at Yakima Chief Hops, who did a lot of work with, with beer and hops in this, in this world. He found 1,400 thiols in beer, and he suspects there's at least 1,000 in cannabis. So N-butane thiol 1 is responsible, one of the three that's responsible for the skunk smell. That's not actually a terpene profile. So what we're learning is that, you know, you've got your cannabinoid profile, you've got your terpene profile, almost like an upside down pyramid sitting on this very small box of aromatic compounds like thioates and thiols. And although that's a very small amount, it tends to shift that upside down pyramid quite easily. Meaning if you've ever seen, you know, there's a thiol that will smell like skunk. You know, you, you add the smallest molecule to that and you can turn it to, you know, fresh strawberries or to a, to a rotten baby's diaper. You know, and that doesn't involve like this huge percentage or a dominant terpene because these thiols and thioates are never dominant compared to the numbers uh, that you get in terpenes, but yet they seem to have an importance in the shifting of the profile in regards to, you know, how we evaluate that, that sensory experience. And when we get to sensory evaluation, we also have to really recognize, and I would, you know, sort of instill this upon anyone that wants to test cannabis, you need to first discover where your sensitivities are. Like, oh, I'm really sensitive to linalool. It can be in a very small amount. And to me, it smells like it's times 10. That's not actually for me. I was using that as an example, but Mike pointed at himself. So when Mike, you know, is sensory evaluating cannabinoid contents with profiles that are high in linalool, he's going to experience it a little bit differently from the person next to him who say doesn't have a sensitivity to linalool or maybe even has a blind spot to linalool. So you want to find out what your sensitivities are, what you're hypersensitive to, and more importantly, what you're blinded by. What are the compounds that you are unable to, to smell or taste or experience? Because that is going to shift the entire profile and how you uh, evaluate that sensory experience. Cool. Thank you for that uh, deep dive. Hartley, I know you wanted to say something before I asked that follow-up question. Do you, is that thought still yeah. relevant? Do you want to share it still? No, I was just going to uh, to second the, the the comment on the organic and the, the living soil producing uh, much superior terpene profiles. And um, from my understanding, uh, you know, from a phytochemical perspective, all of those chemicals that we're after, the cannabinoids, the terpenoids, they're all secondary metabolites for the plant, right? And uh, secondary meaning that the plant only produces them after they've produced the primary metabolites, right? And primary metabolites are all about structure, you know, protein, carbohydrates, 
um, all the basic building blocks of the plant. And then the secondary metabolites are those defense molecules that are terpenes and cannabinoids. So if you have a plant in a salt-based growing system where there's no, uh, there's no fungi or no bacteria attacking or, or, or on t- latched onto the plant, the plant doesn't really have to produce those secondary metabolites because a lot of those secondary metabolites are defense-related uh, compounds. So the, the living soil just puts a plant, uh, exposes it to nature's plethora of microbes, and, and that's why we see that response in terpenes and cannabinoids. Um, so it's a fascinating component, and it's really hard to get that when you're growing in a sterile, a salt-based environment. I didn't realize that terps and cannabinoids were uh, a defense mechanism for for plants. That's news to me. So the the cannabinoids actually are a subclass of terpenes. Cannabinoids are actually a type of terpene that specifically has two or three rings in it. So when you look at the class of all the terpenoids and volatile organic compounds, you know the thiols that Mark mentioned are ter- are a class of essential oils that contain sulfur compounds. There's also what's called ketones. There's what's called um, terpenoids, terpene alcohols, which are essentially your essential oils that contain an alcohol group. And one that I think the majority of people are kind of beginning to become interested are the terpenes or terpenoids. So currently Health Canada doesn't require any terpene, terpenoid, thiol, ketone, or uh, other essential oil. They're only required to list the cannabinoid content because the cannabinoids were were earlier deemed as uh, the psychoactive compound. Now the over oversight not including the terpenoid is is like saying, hey, we're going to package beer, but we're only going to list the alcohol content. What what does that lead to? It leads to a bunch of alcohol producers that are producing malt liquor and high alcohol content moonshine. But if we can't, you know, put on the label like many wine producers do, you know, how it was grown using biodynamic or organic methods, what sort of terroir contributed to the environmental or terpenoid factors, and what sort of biodynamic practices help to improve the terpenoid content, it's oftentimes leaving the consumer un- undereducated. But having producers be able to label their product as being biodynamic or organically certified is a good indicator to the consumers that, hey, you know, this was grown organically, you know, science is starting to document that biodynamically cultivated cannabis, where you have a greater amount of uh, eco- ecology, microbiome, in endo and ecto mycorrhizal bacteria, as well as fungi within the soil, those bacteria, mycorrhizal fungi within the root mass actually produce the majority of the terpenoid precursors that are then traded with the plant in exchange for sugar produced by photosynthesis and then upregulated in the plant to the the trichromes that then synthesize the cannabinoids. So the more alive, the more biodynamic your soil root is, the better the roots, the tastier the fruits. (laughs) So, you know, what what I'd like to say, what's going well within the Canadian market? You know, I I hold a unique perspective because I was I was part of Colorado's rollout with their regulations and Washington's and I've consulted on a few other states. And generally speaking, whenever you have a new market that rolls out, there's a learning period. You know, the re- there's the first couple of years, the regulators have to be able to not only write the regulations, but also all of the sub rules, figure out how they're going to conduct inspections, go through the training of their regulators, because oftentimes you're taking cops or uh, regulators that aren't familiar with cannabis, and then having to, to train them how to regulate cannabis. And to be honest, if I have a regulator here that came from the electrical inspection industry, is he going to understand the fluid dynamics of supercritical carbon dioxide distillation? Probably not. So many of those regulators rely on platforms like this and experts that they're uh, inter- interacting with during these inspections to actually learn. So there's usually a couple year period where we see the kind of industry gets off to a good start, starts taking off like crazy. Then the weight of the regulations hit, and oftentimes regulators are 
conservative when they try and pass their initial regulations. They don't want to let all the cats out of the bag. So they're going to hold back on some things. You know, here in Canada, they held back on direct sale. They held back on public consumption. They held back on um, cultivation and distribution of, of plant genetics. So now that we've established the industry, and I'd like to kind of repeat what Hartley said, some of the best successes that I've seen within the Canadian industry has been dependent on the collaboration between traditional market and moving those traditional market uh, actors, the medical patients, the black market or traditional market producers, and transitioning them into the regulated market. Because by getting them into the regulated market, those are the experts. They may not understand the laws, but we can hire lawyers for that. They may not understand the CRA, but we can hire accountants for that. We need people that are, you know, understand the soil microbiology in order to produce the cannabis that the consumers want. If we can produce the cannabis on scale, that's as good or better quality as the traditional market because we got investors at our back and at a cost competitive market to the traditional market, we're going to, going to continue to see a tr increased trend in consumers transitioning from the traditional market to the recreational market. One of the things I've seen you know, here, here at Embark, the best selling product at Embark was not developed here at Embark. It was developed in the traditional market. Mark mentioned it, it's the hazel hash stick. We can't make them fast enough to keep up with the provincial demand. And we only have a small number of consumers because of the provincial monopoly on distribution. We've actually had to turn down provinces because we can't keep up with our current production capacity. Now we can be smart and you know strategically scale up our production, but obviously it'd be a lot easier to scale up our production you know, if we could form partnerships with micro cultivators and, you know, those micro cultivators have retail shops in their neighborhoods that want to carry their product. And the only way that they can carry their product is if that cultivator then sells it to us, we then sell it to the province, the province then sells it to the retail shop. That's three levels, three sa sales, three transactions that have to be done when it should be as simple as we do a toll processing for a for a cultivation farm, assuming they have a sales amendment, they, they should be able to sell directly to the retailers or, or even to the consumers. I mean, that's, I can go online and buy enough alcohol to kill myself and have it shipped directly from a liquor distillery and kill myself tonight. But I can't, I can't buy cannabis, which has zero recorded deaths from directly from anybody other than the government distributors. So I think that there's there's a you know the early market entrants oftentimes were well-funded companies that were able to use leverage the market's investment in order to expedite their mark their transition into the legal market. Over the last two years, now that we've gotten the big boys publicly traded companies licensed, we're starting to see a lot more micros starting to get their licenses. Obviously, micros aren't as well funded. So you don't have teams of people filling out the paperwork. We have smaller groups of people that are passionate and they're figuring out how to fill out the proper forms, get the rezoning, the Health Canada security clearances. Thank you, Health Canada, for approving my security clearance. It only took me 10 months and I have a cannabis arrest record. I was thrown in jail for possession of cannabis and I was using cannabis to treat my medical epilepsy. So guess what happened when I got out of jail? I went right back to cultivating cannabis and working in the industry. So it's one of those things that I think that many of the regulators have tried to create a conservative rules in order to prevent the over proliferation without actually part allowing the industry and traditional market actors to participate in the discussion or planning or regulation. You know, I think there, there should be an industry trade group that has collaboration with, with the provinces in creating the rules, because I think it's, I think it's a travesty that the, these small craft producers are, are failing because the monopoly on distribution, there's a government monopoly on distribution. And, you know, as an American, no taxation without representation. So by the, if the government wants to make it increasingly difficult for those traditional market uh, cultivators to transition in a regulated market and get their product to market, you're gonna see people, companies fail and those growers aren't gonna stop growing. They're just gonna go back into the black market. So we want 
to provide them every tool at our disposal. And we want to provide them with as much support in order to make that transition into the regulated market, capture their tax dollars, get consumers transitioning into the regulated market because product prices are cheaper, the quality is better. And as a, as a medical patient, I only buy tested product because I don't want to consume something that could trigger a seizure. I don't want to consume something that could cause downstream side effects due to pesticides, et cetera. So, you know, I'm, I've become much more picky as a consumer, as I become educated, mm -hmm. how much education can I put on the outside of the box? Yeah. Let's Marcus, look at the flip side of that though. The flip side of Canada's over-regulation versus America's no regulations, and they've destroyed their CBD industry. They went from $60,000 kilos of CBD to like $600 kilos of CBD. And I'm talking like isolate 99.7%. So, you know, for all the people that are sitting like, oh, they just need to open the doors and let us all do whatever we want. Well, that, that comes with a price too. And if everyone just started growing cannabis and there was no regulations, you would see the majority of it would be bunk just like it is now. Um, which would make the good stuff even harder to find for people. And it would just be, you know, you, you end up, it's, it's human beings tend to have this natural ability to take, to race to the bottom. Let's race <laughs> to the bottom. Let's see. What the, and I'm like, I'm an anomaly because I have no interest in doing that. And, and I know also, which has really hurt my soul that not everyone wants what I want. Not everyone wants like the best hash and the meltiest, tastiest, like they just don't. I've had, con I've had enough conversations with people like my friend Debbie Goldsbury, who was one of the founders of the Berkeley Patients Group with Etienne Fontaine back in the day. They've been selling cannabis in California for 25 years to customers. And when you ask them, like even patients, like, well, what are they mostly interested in? It's like, well, beyond finding something that works, they want to know how much THC is in it and how much it costs. And that's, that's it. That's what they want to know. It's a travesty. It's, it is what it is, you know, and, and every bud tender I talk to in Canada, aside from the one gung ho guy that might know who I am and follows hash church and is all excited, you know, he's like, yeah, most people don't really care, dude. They're kind of looking for some pre-roll joints or some like inexpensive ounces. And so what our job is as processors and extractors is to show people that, you know, it's, it's the, it's the resin that you're enjoying on the plant. And so a lot of these people, they don't, they're not hash smokers. So why is the hazel so popular? Well, we took the hash and we turned it into the smoking vessel. You don't need a rig. You don't need a pipe. You don't need a screen. You don't need a dabber. You don't need a torch. You just need the lighter that you were going to light your joint with and you light your hazel with it. So we've got another product coming out in a similar stream, kind of hazel-like, but in the vein of COVID-friendly. Hazels were great in the back in the day because you could share them. Now nobody shares anything. So now when you light a hazel, you're smoking a gram of hash, which for me, <laughs> no problem. I love that. But for a lot of people, they're like, holy shit, girl, like I smoked a little bit and then I put it down. So we're coming out with a product that is five paper one hitters, a very thick paper. And they're like wow. the size of a tube. They've got a stainless steel uh, like thimble that goes right in the center uh, on the top. And we put 0.2 of a gram of hash in. There's five of them per package. So you'll get one gram of hash. It'll be that same $24 to $28 price point that you pay for a gram of hash already. But now we've broken it up, made it user friendly, made it convenient and made it shareable. So now you can go buy a gram with four of your friends and each of you has this 0.2 of a gram. And for those of you that don't know, when you smoke 0.2 of a gram and Mike and I have done it a few times out skateboarding, it's like eight to 10 rips per tube. So imagine a 25 to $29 price point, you're getting a gram of hash and you're getting like, you know, 40 to 50 rips that you can share with, with your friends. So it's all about creating novel products, bringing the cannabis user into the education of like, you know, kind of holding their hand and being like, look, I know you like your joints, but what you really like on the joint is the resin and the dilution factor. So we could get rid of the paper, the glue, the plant. Oh, you, we can't hear you anymore, Marcus. Is it just me or Hartley, Mike? Can you guys hear him? Just cut out there at the last. We, yeah, like we, last thing we heard is the paper, the glue, and now we can see your sure. mouth moving but can't hear anything. No, now you're muted. Try unmuting and see if... 
Yeah. So what, as Mark was saying, you know, by take being able to t create those one hitters that have, we, Oh, you're good. Mark. Oh, I think, yeah. I think we can hear you now. Yeah, that worked. Yeah. So just bringing in these, these kids, like Mike was about to say, bringing in these, these, these people who they, they like the resin, but they think they like the plant matter. It's like, oh, I just like joints. It's like, well, I can promise you I can give you that same feeling in a cleaner, more unadulterated way because let's be honest, there's no way smoking cannabis resin with plant matter, uh, cellulose and fibers, paper and glue is going to increase the caliber or experience of the high. And so that's kind of what we're slowly trying to do. Bring these people who just want to go buy a pack of joints and, and get them into some hazels or get them into some hash hits and slowly, you know, it might take them a couple of years before they're like, you know, I want to try some bubble man branded uh, bubble hash or some rosin. But that's literally for the people that's for the people who have finished all the side missions and they're at the final boss. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. And I mean, I, I don't buy my wine based on the alcohol content, right? I buy, I buy it based on the label. You know, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, craft grows because, you know, I'm here in Canada. I, I want to be able to support Canadian wineries. But if I had to buy al my alcohol based solely on the alcohol content, I'd probably be buying ethanol, right? Pure moonshine or whatever. And to be honest, I worked in the biofuels industry before I got into the cannabis industry. You can make a gallon of grain ethanol for less than a dollar a gallon. Most of that grain alcohol that's high proof is used in the biofuels industry, you know, E85 gas. And that E85 gas can be produced, sold, distributed for under $3 a gallon. That's under a dollar a liter. Uh, here in Canada, it'll be $3 a liter for reasons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know being able, as a you know as a primarily cannabis consumer but occasionally i'll you know drink drink some whiskey or some wine and what i'm looking for in that whiskey and the wine are you know generally craft producers i'm looking for the story that's on that label and to be honest if i if i look at a bottle and it doesn't say where it was grown what's in it what type of grape varietals Am I really going to be interested in you doing anything other than making a mixed drink with it? Probably not. So I think that, you know, what it, Mark and I have talked about this a couple of times, when we transition from medical where you had to be able, willing to accept the risks to go to those medical stores into traditional, it opened up a much broader spectrum of consumers. Many of those consumers are not nearly as educated as their traditional market consumers. So we're essentially having to go literally go back to episode one of Hash Church, where we're explaining the difference between dry sift and bubble hash and restart that whole educational circuit again. So educating the bud tenders at the retail stores. It's very difficult to educate a bud tender at a retail store when the only thing I can show them is a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. If I... If I could let them smell the flowers because I'm a producer, if I could let them see the flowers because I'm a grower, if I could let them try the hash because I'm a hash producer, you know, bartenders generally have tasted the alcohol that they're selling. And, and we, we're regulated producers. Even though we have an R&D license, we have to produce the product, package it, list it, ship it to the distributor, whether it's a medical platform or, or retail, and only after it's reached those retail distribution centers can we try the products that we're trying to sell. And, you know, the R&D license kind of opens up the door to some BioSA, but, you know, that creates three levels of regulation that we have to go through before we can actually taste a sample. In the alcohol industry, you go, you go into your distillery, pop open a barrel, and they call it the angel share. Um, now, I, I don't think we should be allowing consumers or employees to consume on site because that's a safety hazard and i'm on the safety team here at embark but i do think that you know we should be a, as an industry allowed to be able to you know create samples that that's something that wasn't allowed in the first two years of washington's market but washington allowed bud tenders to receive samples and they regulated it so i think bud tenders could only receive a quarter gram per strain per lot per week um, but you could also use or uh, provide retail shops up to one gram of an extract in order to negotiate a sale. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a if I'm a retail store manager and I was able to 
get a gram sample, take it home, try it, Am I going to be able to educate myself on how that product looks, tastes, smells, and has effects? I'll, I'm, that's going to be much more effective in making business decisions as a retail distributor than just being able to read a buy sheet or go, going onto the provincial wholesale site and reading what's listed online or going and on. Just, and it just makes total sense. Like what industry out there other than cannabis are you not allowed to sample before you make a big decision like that of what you're going to stock? And you're like every single industry out there. The only one I know is plutonium. <laughs> and that's not an industry where we want to be sampling that radioactive waste. <laughs> um, so so uh, to our to our guests here, we are getting close to time. Are, do you guys have the capacity to go over and keep this discussion going? Or do you have to stop at 1130? I'm good. Okay, we got two thumbs up. Marcus. Or... I'm not going to lie. I've got powder on the mountain behind me and it wants my attention, but I'll, yeah. I'll stay for a little bit. Cool. And if, and if you choose that you, you want to dip out, I will not judge you for it because you only booked to 1130. <laughs> and that powder is pretty important, I, I will say. Um, Hartley, we haven't heard from you for a while. Do you, is there something uh, something you want to add to the discussion and where, where we've arrived at so far? No, I think uh, the points uh, the two gentlemen, Marcus and Michael, are, are, are talking about, um, they're, they're great points, you know, especially on the sampling component. You know, how can you, it's, it's such a risk to put a product out there. You don't know how it hits. You, you don't know if it's going to deliver that flavor profile, you know, and you're putting your brand on the line. So that's a challenge that definitely I, I wish there was less regulatory barriers to to be able to sample um yeah that's that's a huge one especially for these extracts where the the, the price per gram is so much more than than the flower right you've got a higher risk product in terms of economic value so you know i would second that yeah. as a challenge the sampling and and none of the provinces uh making keeping the vaults cold so we keep our hash yeah. and our extracts cold, 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 cold. The minute they go out, we can't control it anymore. But I've told every store, all these stores that are fighting for space and sales, they're like, oh, if, could you give me one tip that would give us an advantage over our, our, over our, our competition? I'm like, I can give you the best tip. I can give you the, the tip. You need to keep everything in here cold all the time your vault if i walk into it right now is it going to be room temperature are the terpenes going to be voltizing and boiling off of course they are and every single vault i went into and i'm, I'm talking about places like manitoba and saskatchewan and they, these guys would say well we just can't afford that and i'm like really in a province that's minus 40 eight months of the year you can't afford to keep this room cold you're actually paying to keep it warm. <laughs> yeah, you're the root cellar. Yeah. So in, in the same box. Tons of Canada is cold in the winter. Like the majority of Canada is cold in the winter. If you designed a system that just pulled air in from outside and filtered, you could have a nice cold room. Now, for me, flour should be around the four degrees Celsius temperature. But if you're getting into extracts, Mike and I saw hash volatize and congeal at three degrees Celsius in our refrigerator. It had to go into an actual minus 10 to minus 20 freezer for the terpenes and those aromatic compounds to just stop shaking and to kind of, you know, and that's the way you preserve things. The unfortunate factor is, is that a lot of people are growing decent material, but by the time it gets packaged, be time, yeah, you know, yeah. the active water content is absolutely wrong in the packaging. The packaging is poor because it's being followed by really regulations more than common sense for the product. And then we're all in the produce in, uh, business here and none of us keeps anything cold. It just goes to the provinces. It sits at room temperature. Then it goes out to these shops and it sits at room temperature. And if you've really, if it's been there just one or two months, I mean, have you ever put hash for one or two months just on the, like out on your uh, on your table at room temperature? It gets pretty stale pretty fast. You, the terpenes volatize out, and then you get this transition of THCA and whatever novel cannabinoids may be present, and you get this CBN, and everyone knows the CBN taste. It's just uh, it's not the taste that we're looking for. It's kind of the the opposite of the, the that bouquet that we're looking for when we uh, want to enjoy a cannabis product. 
Yeah, CBN's being researched as a potential narcotic and opiate replacement. So by not supporting the cold chain of produce from grow to consumers, the government's essentially creating a market that's making the cannabis more intoxicating because it's promoting CBN distribution as opposed to THCA produ production. THCA, not psychoactive. Th when it converts to THC, it becomes psychoactive. But once you go, obviously, the three main factors, heat, oxygen, and light, UV, UV. So if you are exposing it to sunlight because of poor storage practices, if you're exposing it to heat because it's not cold chain, or you're exposing it to oxygen because product isn't stored right or packaged right or in you know mylar bags, and mylar bags like to be sealed but all, don't always form the best airtight seals, you're going to see that degradation. And without direct sale, it's we're seeing products sit on shelves for months, quarters, years before it reaches the consumer. So yeah. I yeah, I've I've yeah. seen beautiful product at farms that when I go buy the product at the retail side, looks nothing looks no two the same. Yeah, yeah. Both the retail and the uh the, the provincial board distribution centers every step along the chain needs to have some sort of cold storage, cold uh, transportation. You know, we do it for fish, we do it for produce. Why can't we do it for a product that, you know, a price per gram is, is way higher than, than fish and produce. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think, uh, yeah, if we all keep pushing, the, the day may come. Well, I think it's an inf infrastructure problem first and foremost, and a great way of using an example. There's, I can go to a, multiplicity of different bars here in Vancouver. But if I buy a drink at a martini bar, it's probably going to cost more than if I buy it at a gas station. And, you know, the cannabis industry is early in that, but we're going to see the same thing. The products, the CBD products that are available at the local gas station or bodega are probably going to be lower quality, lower terpene content, and cheaper than the product, you know, the high-end hash live rosins or high-end hash products that are only going to be available in a limited market, whether that be at the farm gate stores or at the you know higher end boutique retail stores. We haven't seen high end boutique retail stores yet. I haven't found one. I've been to hundreds of retail stores. And you know, as retail stores begin to distinguish themselves from the pack, what we're going to start seeing is that there's going to be you know, retail stores that kind of focus on boutique and potentially use those smell jars or there's going to be, you know, retail stores that have um, actually take the time and spend the money to actually package product in a way that you can see it. Um, so there we are starting to see a few boutique chains come out here. And to be honest, I'm not a regular consumer. I spend the money and drive twice as far to go to those retail stores that have the better selections. So the, the retail stores that have the, you know, we call them sommeliers in the cannabis industry, uh, in the sommeliers in the wine industry, we will we'll call them gangiers or connoisseurs in the cannabis industry. But I think that as we have more retail stores that bring traditional market consumers in as bud tenders, managers, et cetera, you're going to start to see that differentiation within the market. And those, those people that focus on high quality products, you know, you may not have as large of a market cap. You're not going to be selling high-end hash to every gas station, but you're going to have more loyalty within your consumer base. Because any could, anybody can produce a bubblegum flavored vape pen. Very few people can cultivate land race cultivars, preserve those terpenes th through the cold chain, create a wonderfully delicate terpenoid profile that can last all the way through the supply chain, and then distribute it in such a way that the cons educated consumers will form a line down the street for drops. And in, in other states, other markets, we are seeing that craft cultivators with distinct genetics processing in a high-end manner are selling out the products the day that the products drop, while their competitors that are focusing on scale or efficiency are producing products, but it's sitting on the shelves because yeah, it's cheap, but I'm going to buy not the cheapest thing that's on the menu, but I'm going to buy the best that my, you know, my budget allows, right? Yeah. I'm not going to be buying the $150 grams of hash, but I am going to buy the, you know, the highest quality hash that I can get at those regulated retail stores that you know, depending on my budget. Right. 
Awesome. For, for those of you in the audience, uh, uh, Marcus uh, would like uh, some uh, feedback from you guys there. He wants to know where you're all from and what you're, what you're up to and what your name is. So go check out his comment there. Um, to our guests, uh, I'd love to kind of just go in a circle here and just have each of you state what you think is the single biggest challenge that the industry is facing today, um, just in a kind of a short, succinct, um, succinct uh, um, sentence or two. And then uh, after we go through that, we'll, we'll, we'll start to wrap up the discussion, maybe talk about like those, those three things that you share, like how you see that shifting maybe uh, into a way that uh, um, can allow this industry to succeed in a more reasonable manner, where it's not just always trying to figure out, you know, what the pockets are, like you said earlier, Marcus, or how to work around the regulations in a way that allows you to actually um, um, make things work. Um, so, yeah, does it? Does anybody feel uh, like sharing first what they think the single biggest uh, challenge our industry faces is? I think uh, the access, and uh, we've hit this this note a few times in the discussion, the access between producer and final consumer, that needs to be bridged, right? There needs to be a different approach. We need to think outside the box from a regulatory standpoint, policy standpoint. How can we connect producers with with the consumers uh, and allow sales to happen in, in a faster, more effective manner, uh, not just for preserving product quality, but also for that educational component, you know, getting in front of your consumer as a producer to be able to explain, you know, this is this certain micron range. This is produced, you know, with this certain cultivation technique to be able to express that, engage the consumer, you know, on a face to face level. Um, that's going to be huge. That that would be uh, something that would would have a huge impact. And I think you know, Farmgate is uh, is is a, is a step in the right direction. Um, it's also you know not a solve all. Definitely, it's not going to create the access that I'm talking about. Um, it's going to help, but I think that there needs to be uh, you know to be able to make that final sale. Uh, whether it's through third parties, you know, QA approval from someone who has a sales license. Um, you know, to be able to get the product directly to, you know, from your micro cultivation facility or micro processing facility directly to a retail store without having to go through all the months of, of distribution channel uh, and, 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 you know, basically diluting your message. Um, that it's got to be a closer relationship, in my opinion. Mike, what, what are your thoughts? What do you think is the most important uh, issue that needs to be addressed? So I'll, I'll say it in two sentences. Taxation without representation. If, if I have to pay taxes on product, but I cannot actually just directly sell that product to the consumer, you're going to have people consumers going to the black market. So we need to be able to have direct sale to retail stores. We need to be able to have direct sale to the consumers. Yeah, that's going to increase my packaging costs. That's going to drive down my bottom line. It's going to make my packaging manager mad at me. But if I could go online and order some of the products that Embark has, which aren't available in the market because they were small lots, too small for the province to carry, there, we have some fantastic land race genetics that are you know single micron. And I'd buy those if I could, but I can't. So I'm stuck buying the broad micron, full spectrum, bubble hash that's available in the market. Set, second thing is ed education, distribution without education. The bland packaging is driving the malt liquors of the industry. We need to be able to educate the consumers how the cannabis was cultivated, and that requires the ability for producers and licensees to market and include cultivation practices, terpenoid content, and educational marketing products on their packaging. Yeah. Um, and the, obviously, the third one is going probably going to be a controversial one. Let's hear it. I'm curious. <laughs> we need to be able to have on-site consumption. Um, you know, I'm a medical consumer. I don't have children right now, but I do rent where I live. If I'm a, if I'm a renter, I'm not allowed to smoke at home. If I have children, I'm endangering my children by smoking in the room with them. So I think it's absolutely absurd that there is not on-site consumption allowed because I can go to a bar and get drunk as a skunk thrown in jail for fighting, but I can't go meet with friends and discuss you know, trending topics over a, you know, relatively benignly dangerous hazel. So, you know, I think that and I've, I've heard this mentioned on other podcasts. I think that 
if the government is not going to start being progressive and including the consumers and producers in their regulatory uh, advisement and improvement of the law, right? The law is never permanent. It's never static. It'll always be changing. And the government's currently going through an administrative review. But if the, if the native tribes are allowing on-site consumption and the, the government stores or the private retails are not, you're going to have people going to the native tribes to purchase black market drugs instead of going to the regulated facilities, the tax and paying taxes. So I think that everybody should be able to you know, buy their product online, assuming that you can provide some sort of age gate. You should be able to buy direct from the producer, whether that's a farm, because I know there's some fantastic farms that aren't able to get the product to market. And then you should be able to go to you know, I'll say regulated cafes that, you know, if I go to the, if I go to a bar and over drink that, that bartender could be get in trouble if I get, then go dry, get DUI, right? Yeah. We should have the same regulations for bartenders, bud tenders, but tenders should be allowed to, you know, not only show the product, let people smell it, but if, they, if, if a consumer wants to buy a gram, try it in their outside patio and make their decision on that. Because I'm, you know, what we're doing is we're discriminating against people that live in rural communities. If I live three, four hours from the lo local retail store, I got to drive three or four hours to that retail store, buy a gram. What am I supposed to do? Drive three or four hours home, try it. Drive three or four hours back, buy an ounce of it, and then drive three or four hours back. You're discriminating against people that live in rural communities, not by not allowing on-site consumption. Cool. Thanks, Mike. And I, I know BC is uh, really looking at, at on-site consumption now, but specifically in the context of Farmgate, not in the context of uh, broader retail stores like what you um, are Which suggesting. Which would be great when I go up to the coots, but like that doesn't change the fact that yeah. you have parents still smoking in the apartments with their kids, right? Yeah. We need to be able to have cafes. And that's going to be a differentiator between the, you know, there's been some complaints uh, on previous state of crafts stating you know why are why are the government stores having an unfair advantage over the privately owned retail stores if privately re owned retail stores could offer things like delivery like on-site consumption and and you know high-end products you know you're going to ha create a customer base that is more loyal to your branded retail store than than it is based on the the price obviously price is going to be the number one factor especially in recessions but we want to incentivize people to smart, support those smaller companies and we have to support those smaller companies by offering offering differentiating factors you know to me my differentiating factor i look for is education when i go to the retail store and you know terpenes levels listed i don't care about the tac content i'm trying to find you know terpenoid and essential oil profiles that work well with my medical conditions that don't have things like THCV or linalool because linalool affects me more than opiates and THCV some some THCV is used by some epileptic patients to reduce their epileptic seizures for myself THCV can actually potentiate epileptic seizures so if those minor cannabinoids aren't listed on the label or if the terpenoids aren't listed on the label I'm not going to buy yeah. it yeah Thanks, Mike. And last but not least, Marcus, what are what do you think is the most important things that need to be addressed, and how do you think we should go about addressing those issues? Uh, maybe we could stop treating cannabis like uh, plutonium. Maybe we could stop thinking that we need to protect children from it. I think a lot of the um, sort of fuckery that we're having to deal with, pardon my French, stems from that mentality. And maybe the gatekeepers who are currently in charge of this industry could bugger off as well, go to the bar and do their drinking and maybe engage more people who are actually involved in the community and, and actually don't hate cannabis. I think having people that seemingly hate cannabis and everything about it, have those people as gatekeepers in our industry and running the whole show seems uh, borderline insane to me. Um, so I think, I think that's the simple, simplest one. Like we could start just treating cannabis like, 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 listen, if we really want to protect children, we know we need to protect them from alcohol and fentanyl and many of the pharmaceutical drugs that are available today. Those are the things you want to uh, protect children from, maybe even some of the cleaning agents in your house. But in regards to cannabis, do you need to protect your children from that? 
Um, last I checked, they also have endocannabinoid systems. Doesn't mean we're going to be going and getting our kids high and whatnot. We're not idiots. Uh, it's not like they take the keys <laughs> to the car and go driving when they're seven years old. That's super dangerous. It seems like a very benign substance. I agree with Mike, you know, safety people want to say that, oh, well, you got to be safe. It's like, well, you know, no offense, bro, but like me getting my finger caught in a rosin press, sure, that's unsafe, but like me losing uh, you know, my freedom because I'm flipping pounds and doing all this illegal shit back in the day. I, I learned how to be careful and I learned how to do it baked. And so I know we could do that in this industry as well. You know, like it's cannabis is just not, it's, it's, it's such a hard thing to describe because you have people that have never used it and then they come and they try it. They have like an adverse effect. They're like, wow, that was so powerful. I ate an edible and it was just, it just destroyed me. I don't doubt that that capability is out there. And, you know, when it does come to regulations, probably the edibles and the things that we're consuming that are metabolizing in our livers and turning into different compounds that are much stronger than the cannabinoids that we consume. Sure. Like have, have some reg. I'm not opposed to regulations. In fact, the over-regulation of cannabis, some of it can go, some of it can stay. I suspect if we had more over-regulation of our food, air, and water, they wouldn't all be poison right now. And so yeah. maybe maybe the rest of those industries could learn from the cannabis industry and say, hey, we don't want to be ridiculous and make this impossible, but we got to stop subsidizing and cutting corners where basically the people and the earth pay the pay the price. That's where the profit's based on by cutting corners that destroy the planet or potentially people's health. So that, that's kind of what I would say on the topic. Yeah, if it's safe, if it's as safe as coffee or caffeine, right? You can you you can still have a heart attack if you drink too much coffee. Yeah, there's there's a few things with cannabis that could cause negative side effects, but all you know, all we ask for is you know from the regulators is you know parity. If you want yeah. to regulate it like alcohol, treat it like alcohol. If you want to rate, uh, honestly, according to science, and I'm a scientist. You know, if, if it's as dangerous or less dangerous than caffeine, it should be regulated as such. Yeah. I um, to, your, to your point, Marcus, I've been pretty disappointed with the BCLDB recently and how they're rolling out direct delivery because they're basically being unwilling to engage with actual traditional people who have been in this industry, understand what's like what's problematic with their distribution model. They have this attitude of, nope, we know what we're doing. We're the experts. We're not going to ask you for your opinions. We're, we're rejecting the idea of a pilot project. We're not going to commit to taking feedback after it's rolled out. Uh, nana, nana, boo, boo, we know what we're doing. That's kind of <laughs> their attitude. And it's been infuriating because to, to the points of many of these discussions that came earlier, the distribution of these gatekeepers who don't understand this industry and have done, uh, to put it bluntly, a, a completely terrible job over the past few years to to now have the bc government as a whole say hey this is a critical thing we need to fix distribution and then have the gatekeepers just refuse to engage the industry it's 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 a huge issue and i i don't know how we get that to change what steps we is it talking to our mlas and I, like I'm, I'm at a loss because i've i've tried it's my getting best. them out it's getting them out one by one we need to get them out the people that are in the way that are gatekeepers that are blocking the way i mean here's a perfect example we the hazel was created in british columbia we there's tens of thousands of them were sold uh in the legacy days that translated you know they stopped doing it for a very long time we brought it to the legal market well bc ordered i think they ordered them once then then the, one of the people that worked there and they've already gone through three people that i've had to talk to since that read on reddit that you could burn yourself if you lit the joint the the flame would go right through and burn your someone said oh you could burn yourself trying to smoke that and that made a gin that they would not buy any hazels until we added a mouthpiece and so bc went without any hazels for like five months maybe more while Ontario and Alberta were just crushing it and selling tens of thousands of them. So it, it becomes this sort of situation where it's like, who are you helping? Like, what are you, what are you doing? This is the most novel, like can't keep it on the shelf. It's from BC, but you guys don't see the value. And, and, and now it took so long when we went back to them, they said, well, that product's in, in exit mode. So we have to reintroduce it. So now we're filling out all the paperwork again in there. 
they're running us through these hamster wheels again. And it's just like, you know, no offense, but you don't have a clue what you're doing. You're not willing to listen to the people who do have a clue. So, I mean, I'll tell you what you got to do, Sammy. We have to wait until they fuck up so bad they get fired. And it's inevitable. So, so how, to, to me, me I just... Is that, is that what happened in California? People was fucked up so bad they got fired? Well, so there's a great, there's a great example um, that just happened recently. There was, there's an event down in California called the Emerald Cup. Yeah. And at the Emerald Cup, is, it's basically like a cannabis cup. You, you have licensed producers are allowed to rent booth spaces, and those licensed producers can market their products. They also allowed micro producers in California to set up a booth. And basically, you, they initially were telling the micro producers, hey, you can have a jar to show pro people your product. You just cannot sell them any product because it has to be sold by a dispensary. And we have a dispensary booth that's going to distribute your product for you over there. Right. Yeah. So down in California, the regulatory body is called the BCC. The BCC was going around to the booths and telling the booths that they could not display their product. The only thing that they could display is empty boxes. Why would I go to Oktoberfest if I can't drink beer? And we're not even talking about drinking here. It's just looking at it. <laughs> further, further than that. Yeah, exactly. They weren't even giving out samples. Further that, the BCC was caught on Insta one of the Instagram lives harassing medical patients that brought their own medical product that's a violation of federal law hipaa violations you cannot harass medical patients and demand their doctor's uh, medical prescription paperwork so the the head of the bcc and several of the agents i believe it was like 13 or 14 of them ganged up on a couple of medical patients that were that had brought cbd hemp auto flowers to the beast to the emerald cup to basically say hey guys here's the strains that i grew this year and who wants to smoke with me they weren't trying to sell the product they weren't trying they were trying to smoke the weed that they grew and you had a re government regulatory body that violated federal law trying to enforce rules that were only established to regulate the producers i don't know what's happened but i mean there's a potential class action lawsuit that may or may not get employees of the BCC fired for multiple violations on California's medical marijuana 215 law. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm staying out of that, but it's one of those things that what we're going to see here, it's, you know, to me, I'm a, I'm free market libertarian. I'm sorry, Mark politics. <laughs> we, we need, if we as a regulated industry are not going to start representing the reg the traditional market and supporting the traditional markets transition into the regulated market the traditional the traditional market the illegal market is going to continue to thrive if we can figure out a way to you know i get it they want to slowly pass rules and open open up the industry but we have to at least create some parity with the other industries whether that be the coffee industry the alcohol industry and to be honest right right now if it's easier for a patient to go to you know call go online and have somebody deliver their weed from the traditional market you know, and we just allow we're just allowed delivery right i don't think i've been to a government store since they allowed home delivery because i can just call one of my friends that's a manager at a retail store and get my weed delivered to my house so that just cut off all the black market weed delivery because now i can have my licensed weed delivered mm -hmm. and you oh. and and i saw there was a question you know about education and farm gate you know it many consumers are at a very elementary level of you know genetic knowledge they don't know what the terpene profiles are to the flowers right but if if, it, if i as a consumer can, can go to a winery try a couple different types of wine walk through the wine fields i'm going to be able to learn about the different grape varietals that are used in producing the wine and see how it was made and actually become more educated. If the government wants to put a giant black box around the industry that says, hey, the only thing that you can distribute is this black box and people can't try it until they buy the black box, bring it home, um, you're gonna continue to have a mis undereducated consumer base that's only buying based on the potency. And honestly, that's dangerous. Yeah.
Sorry, I just want to I want to bring it back to what you were talking about, Marcus, and and the brief example you brought off, Mike, about um, uh, the BC, DCC, BCC, whatever it was down in California. I, my my fear around this approach of inevitably they will make a fuck up and be forced out. Like I I feel like that's not good enough. Like how many years is it going to take for there to be a situation where these people that are standing in the way actually do? I mean, there's there's just so much stigma in cannabis, for better or for worse. There's stigma that's been around for a class, long long time class action lawsuits are based off of damages they're not based off of hypotheticals so unfortunately we have to let them damage the industry before we can hold them accountable but if there's there's already like consistent damage that's been done that i guess i guess you can't prove it though you can't prove that hey as a result of these restrictions and these rules no, but if, it, if a native tribe can actually open up a farm gate, open up a tasting room, open up a, uh, you know, better retail experience, what you're going to see is those Native American tribes are going to be the preferred retail establishment for the consumers that have, you know, are within driving distance. So, you know, as much as we were, regu we're regulated, but ultimately that regulation is only so far that the government can reach. Right. And ultimately, the, the, gov the government regulators need to understand that the more that they hinder the development of this industry, the more it's supporting the black market. Now, obviously, there needs to be rules established about DUI. There needs to be rules established about uh, the air particulate content in order to prevent secondhand smoke uh, intoxication. But we need to be able to have an open dialogue with the regulators. Um, so that the regulators can say, hey, what's working well, what like we're doing here, what's working well, what can we work on to make the industry better? That dialogue is going to go leaps and bounds. And there's only one state that actually had uh, a government advisory board in the cannabis sector. It's Oregon. And honestly, Oregon has one of the best medical as well as recreational programs in the U.S. right now because you actually have industry professionals on the administrative rules committee with the regulators and they can go back and forth and kind of find that middle ground where yeah we're regulated but we're also meeting the needs of the patients and consumers yeah. there yeah. needs to be more of an advisory panel like you say representation uh, needs to be there and i think there's a lot of groups forming like organizations uh but they're not they're not getting connected. Uh, the government's not letting them sit at the table. Um, you know, the, the agricultural consensus just came out, but that's, that's the most capacity that I can contribute is talking about how many employees, what my square foot, there's no way I can contribute to what my concerns are or what Michael's concerns are. Um, there's no, there's no advisory pathway. And I think, yeah, yeah, there needs to be. Something yeah. So like it's, that as a BC resident who's really like most familiar with what's happening in BC and federally, but not necessarily in other provinces, my, my kind of perspective is that within BC, there's three different organizations that are working to address some of the challenges that exist. The LCRB is working on Farmgate. Uh, the Cannabis Secretariat's office is working on consumption lounges. The BC LDB is working on direct delivery. Those first two organizations they really care. They're really trying to engage people and understand, which is amazing. The BC LDB, not in the slightest. I'm really disappointed in them, especially after all their rhetoric from about half a year ago about how they really were going to be focused on engagement. Um, and then on the federal level, we have the CRA and Health Canada. The CRA has been pretty open, I think, but they don't set their own rules. That's kind of, it takes, you know, to change excise duty, that takes an act of parliament. So that's the challenge there. Now we have to get MPs to actually uh, make a difference to create um, an excise duty model that actually makes sense. Um, and Health Canada, super duper disappointed. I mean, they, they, they're at the three-year mark where by law they have to do a one and a half year engagement um, around uh, um, around analyzing the regulations and how it's been rolled out so far. And they've, they've released their public let's ask for feedback and it's just so limited in scope. It's, you know, you, the questions they ask don't leave the room for you to be critical of what has happened so far. You can't be critical of our packaging or or the microbial testing requirements or what have you. There's so many different, there's a plethora of different things, you know, security clearances and how it can be done based off conjecture, not based off actual proven fact, um, as in a, a rejecting a security clearance. 
And so that's, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge right now in the coming months is it's exactly what you're talking about. How do we get the government to actually listen? And how do you do that when there's organizations or the people who at the very top just think, think of cannabis uh, as just a whatever, an industry that's full of criminals that we don't care about. Everybody's just trying to like hurt the kids and this just stig stigma driven um, point of view. Like it just doesn't make sense. If, if, if it's been legalized, it's, we shouldn't have that be um, the perspective at the very top. And I, I don't know how we make that change. Um, but personally, I, I don't think it's good enough to wait around until they make a mistake and are forced out because that theoretically could never happen. And that, and that would be I, yeah, terrible. I think it starts it starts with conversations. It starts with, you know, shows like this. Um, you got to start somewhere, take that first step. That's why I love, you know, what, what you do and Sammy here with, with the state of crap. This is where, you know, ideas can be thrown around openly, you know, with engaging people. Um, but we need more of this. We need we need it needs to bleed into into policy. It needs to have that upper stream impact. Yeah, it's going to be by self or by suit, right? So they're either going to accept this, accept the reality that they need to engage the the consumers as well as the producers and processors, or what? Because right now the only people that I can see really communicating with are the lobbyists for the publicly traded companies. Now, it that's fine. We we all need lobbyists, right? But if they're not going to going to proactively engage the producer, processor, and consumers, what's going to end up happening, and I've seen happen in several states down in the U.S., is that you end up having small licensees forming trade organizations. Those trade organizations create memberships. Those memberships then create, you know, the membership fees pays for lobbyists, and then you start having the lobbyists go to them. If if they're not going to be proactive about the, the consumer and producer engagement. Those, those membership groups, the big players, and where necessary, the public consumers may have to file suit in order to enact those changes. I hate lawsuits, and I have a law degree. But ultimately, I would much rather be proactive in developing a positive dialogue, which is why I'm here, as opposed to have to just suffer my way through it. I'm going to get through it. I'm not leaving the industry, regardless of how difficult they're making it. I'm going to stay in this industry I because I'm fascinated with the scientific potential of ca the cannabis plant as a you know organic bio biomedical biosynthetic um, platform in order to you know potentially create a multiplicity of different herbal supplements and potentially pharmaceutical products. But there's a ton of research that needs to be done. And, you know, we haven't talked at all about uh, synthetic cannabinoids or biosynthetic cannabinoids. But ultimately, you know, the government is just barely scratching the surface. And the more that they engage the consumers, the producers and process processors and manufacturers, the faster we can educate all of the regulators and that the better that they're educated, the regulators are educated and the consumers are edu educated, the faster the industries can evolve. I, I think that Canada can actually surp surpass California. We can export. California can't export to federal law changes. So w Canada has a wonderful opportunity of surpassing the Middle East, the West Coast of the U.S., and becoming the the global powerhouse for cannabis production and right now they're just squandering that opportunity away <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and and the sad thing is that you know if you establish yourself as that leader now in the early days when you're like one of two countries that have fully legalized cannabis then you have cemented your position like even even if a bunch of other countries come online in the following decades like you have established yourself as one of the leaders and you're not going to fall from that throne that you create for yourself. And unfortunately with the government on many different levels is still driven by stigma, even though it's been legalized and that is just hampering that opportunity and making it not. And how, reality. how much, how much investment came into Canada because the TSX can will list cannabis companies, billions of dollars of investment. Mm -hmm. That same, if we want billions of dollars in tax revenue, we have to, allow the government to regulate us in such a manner that allows and promotes 
the licensing, the regulation, and the international distribution of Canadian-made, Canadian-tested, Canadian-regulated products. Because, yeah, Canada's got the same population of California, but Canada can export to Asia, Europe, and a multiplicity of medical markets. And I can count on one hand the number of big LPs that are actually doing it because they have the, the capital. There's yeah. That's boggling. Like, I think that they're, you know, it, it, in, as com, as countries come online, there should be government grants that that enable or promote small licensees to be able to distribute those medical pro, medical certified products to places like Europe because you're going you're increasing medical access to the sick and dying patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's it's something that you know I there's a reason why I moved to Canada instead of states like California. There's there is more potential here based on the rules and regulations than any other state in the US. And I, as a medical patient, am better protected here in Canada than any other state in the US. But with that said, you know, there is a lot of hindering of the development of this industry because of the lack of consumer producer licensee and regulator communication, because the only real communication that I see are, you know, the regulators I'm sure are watching this, this podcast. And I watch every podcast that I see has a regulator on it. That's not a dialogue. That's not an advisory committee, right? We're so, still siloed. We're still siloed. And that micromanaging is honestly the only, the only people that are going to be heard when you're micromanaging and siloing the industry are the people with the biggest budgets, which, yeah. which, which is why you have these massive facilities that can't sell their weed while you have these small micros that aren't able to get the product to market because the only, only one that's got a lobbyist are those big boys. Yeah. And I want to become a big boy and don't get me wrong, but I want to do it sustainably do, producing quality products. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, see a hyper devaluation in my shareholders. I, in, I intend to make every one of my shareholders of which there's hundreds. I intend to make them money. I don't want them to lose money by, you know, over hyping my share price and then seeing it crash. So I think there's a ton of potential within the Canadian market, but the key, the key is, is, you know, as we're going through the next year and a half where the government's reviewing it, we need to see the government engage the consumers, the medical patients, the licensed producers, micro producers, especially, as well as the regulated uh, processors and, and manufacturers. So to anybody, to anybody listening to this podcast here, whether on YouTube or here live right now, um, specifically in regards to that 18 month review that's happening with health Canada right now, the biggest thing that you can do to affect change in my opinion is to reach out to your MP because this is a, uh, it's the cannabis act, which was an act of parliament that, that, that enforced this review to take place. Um, and if you reach out to your MP and explain, Hey, these are all the things that are happening in the cannabis sector that are completely bullshit that are regulated on that federal level and the review that's taking place does not even allow you to criticize these things what's the point of the review if we can't actually criticize the, the serious challenges that are completely hindering our ability to have business and you know health canada just in case you guys aren't aware listening to this they don't have a mandate to support business that's not one of their actual organizational uh, requirements they don't care about your business what they care about is consumer health and safety that's it and so that leads to a lot of challenges where the organization in question just doesn't actually have it in their mandate to help you succeed as a business and when we're, when we're talking about you know so so anyway I'll, I'll, that's all i'll say around that but yeah i think um that's i've i've had conversations through the cannabis economic the cannabis economic development council uh here in the kootenays that i'm part of with two MPs that are that are local here, and they're both appalled to discover kind of what's been going on in the cannabis industry. They had no idea that excise duty is the way that it was, and so on and so forth. And they are now reaching out to their contacts within um, the the federal government to, to kind of have chats with the minister of health and so on and so forth, kind of start a conversation going from that level. And I think every MP, if they truly care about their constituency, um, is. I mean, they're, they're, they 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 have to take a conversation with you if, if you're their constituents, um, and hopefully they care enough to actually be willing to 
see what they can do for you uh, and take steps to make things better. But I think I think that's going to be a thing that we can all do that will make a big difference um, with this review that Health Canada is going through. Um, Mike and Hartley, any last words before we wrap this up here? Oh, I think we nailed it. <laughs> yeah, all, every consumer and every medical patient should be writing a letter to their MP. Just let them know what you think. Let them know what you feel. If you, if you saw an increase in access to medical product or decrease, if you saw your, the prices that you're paying every month go up or go down, let them know. Because honestly, they, they probably don't know the problems that we're going with. And there's a great example where, you know, oftentimes I've seen city councils or, you know, they'll try and pass these rules and regs for the zoning. And then you show up and you start explaining to them, hey, we get it. You guys want to try and silo the cannabis industry into your industrial park. Well, let me explain to you why it's probably better to do it into a agricultural land reserve as opposed to an industrial park, because industrial parks may have potential heavy metals in the area, may negatively affect the property values. So there's going to, you know, we're a processing facility. We had to rezone our building from a heavy industrial to a light industrial that special zoning for cannabis. It shouldn't have taken us 18 months, but it did. So it ultimately, it took my company longer to rezone our building than it did to get Health Canada's approval. So, you know, it, it's the same thing is going to be true. The, long, the longer and less that they engage the producers, processors, retailers, and medical patient consumers, the slower that this industry is going to grow. The slower that this industry grows, the greater opportunity companies are going to see abroad. And ultimately, we want Canada, we want Canada to thrive as an economy. And in every in every state that had cannabis legalized and regulated, we didn't see a recession in 2008. We didn't see a recession in 2012. And we're not going to see a recession next year in any market that has effective medical cannabis access. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you as well to Marcus, a.k.a. Bubble Man. Even though you're not here to hear this, thanks right now. I will send you an email thanking you after this. Um, to uh, anybody watching this on YouTube, we'd appreciate uh, a like and a subscribe. Uh, yeah, Mike Mike gives us two thumbs up, not just one. Smash that thumbs up! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> uh, next up, well, we're not gonna do New Year's Eve. That's not gonna be our next uh, state of craft. We're gonna be doing skipping a week uh, and doing it three weeks, three Fridays from now. Uh, and we have actually somebody who's been in attendance of this uh, this episode here. We have uh, Shannon Ross, um, who um, uh, is probably better known over the past couple of years as one of the consultants that spearheaded the Cannabis Business Transition Initiative at Community Futures in Nelson, BC. Uh, they helped, I think, about 50, 55 or so uh, different micro cultivators uh, go through the licensing process. And uh, there is a much larger percentage of BC micros that have been licensed in uh, the Kootenays relative to the rest of BC, uh, in the large part thanks to the amazing service that they've done. Um, that project has uh, come to a close, uh, mostly due to funding challenges as a result of COVID taking all the funding that was initially earmarked for the program. Um, and uh, what Shannon and a few other cultivators have done is they've launched a... Um, a, uh, a, a grower owned processing facility to help all of the uh, small scale cultivators in this area be able to bring their product to market. Uh, and she she also started the Cannabis Economic Development Council that I alluded to earlier that I'm part of here in the Kootenays. Uh, we have lots of representation from both local government and um, service providers and licensed producers on that organization. Uh, but yeah, the focus of that um, I'm not going to say what the focus is because it's going to be up to Shannon what she wants to share, but she's an incredible woman who's done incredible things. And, uh, and yeah, she's serving as the CEO of Antidote. That's the name of that processing facility. Um, and uh, I imagine a lot of it will talk about uh, the distribution challenges that uh, led to her uh, choosing to spearhead that project and um, what she's learned so far in that journey and where she sees uh, the industry going. Um, she's also a veteran of this industry, having been growing organic permaculture, uh, both food and cannabis for decades. Um, but uh, that'll be episode 19. Um, 
Mike Hartley and Bubble Man, though you aren't here anymore, thank you so much for ringing out uh, 2021 with us here on this Data Craft. Uh, this has been episode 18. Um, really incredible discussion. I have uh, learned quite a lot in this conversation. Um, and uh, thank you to our audience for being here today. We uh, appreciate you as always and look forward to um, seeing you in the new year. I'm going right. to hit the end of it. Yeah, if, if if you if you miss the beginning, as soon as this ends in a minute or two, it'll just restart. So you can just hang around and uh, watch from the start if you wanted to catch that. Bye, guys. Thank you, Sammy. Thanks, Mike. Take care.